Welcome to everybody watching. Uh, we are still waiting a little bit for George, but we're probably going to go ahead and get started um, with our discussion on the digital divide. My name is Jeffrey Westling. I am a technology and innovation policy fellow here at the R Street Institute. Um, and we've got a great panel for you today. We've got Dr. Uh, Hal Singer. He is the managing director of Econ One or at e Econ One Research Center. Uh, he's an adjunct professor at Georgetown's uh, uh, McDonough Heath School of Business and a senior fellow at George Washington Institute of Public Policy. We also have Dr. Nicole Turner Lee, who's a senior fellow of Governance Studies and the director of the Center for Technology and Innovation at Brookings. And then finally, we've got Carlos Gutierrez, who's the deputy uh, director and general counsel of, uh, for the LGBT Technology Partnership. So today we wanted to bring everybody together to have a discussion about, you know, the, the digital divide when we have this gap between those who are have access and, you know, have adopted broadband and those who don't. And with the pandemic, you know, driving some of these wedges in, into our society, we really wanted to break down what are the appropriate responses, what are long term, short term, how can we make sure people get the most benefit out of the promise of the internet and the promise of broadband. Uh, so just to kind of kick us off, I wanted to start generally talking about what is the digital divide and, and, you know, what is the human element here? Because we don't want to get lost in some of these discussions and forget about who there are the people that we're trying to make sure uh, have the full opportunity of, of modern internet. Uh, so Nicole, I guess we can start with you if you want to go ahead and, and talk a little bit about what is the digital divide and, you know, some of these communities that are being impacted by it. No, thank you, Jeffrey, and thank you to Arshi for having me, and I'm so glad to be on a panel with people I haven't seen in a long time, but uh, glad to see you, Hal and Carlos, and hopefully George over video. So this is interesting, and I'm going to do a shameless plug that I have a book coming out on the U.S. digital divide. It's called Digitally Invisible, How the Internet is Creating the New Underclass. It'll be out next year um, under Brookings Press, so thank you, Jeff, for that cue up. Um, and I, I think when I think about the digital divide, I'm gonna put it like this. When Larry Irving, who was at the NTIA, came up with the concept um, during the time of the report falling through the net of the digital divide, it was meant to be very binary, right? Who had access, who didn't, who was online, who wasn't, who had a device, who didn't, who had digital literacy, who didn't. And I think today, and I think this is evidenced pretty much in the big tech hearing that we saw a couple uh, last week, is that technology is really changing the way that we live, learn, earn, and even love, right? We are doing so many things with technology from commerce to now education to employment that it, in many respects, right, it is changing like the way that we communicate and how we just get things done in society. And for those of us who are tech wonks, we always thought of technology as a way to solve social problems and as a way to essentially create these certain efficiencies when it came to getting tasks done. Now, as we look at existing technology and then emerging technologies to come, technology is essentially changing the language. It is becoming the new public square um, as we see these shifts in usage and these high demands on networks, etc. So what does that mean, Jeff, for the digital divide today? Um, I coined this term digitally invisible because I think at the end of the day, we are no longer in a binary context of who's online, who can afford it, et cetera. We are now seeing this multifaceted view of technology in ways that actually determine your quality of life and your success you know, economically, politically, socially, and educationally. So I'm just going to end here and just sort of give people an example. You look at what has happened with this pandemic and you have to say to yourself, outside of the nasty public health consequences, the physical social distancing has made it possible for us to communicate via an online connection. And if that is the case, and we're thinking about all of the things that we're now able to do, remote visits with our doctors, ordering from e-commerce sites, being able to get our kids online for virtual education, these are, to people like us on this call, you know, pretty much intuitive and very much available. When we now look at the digital divide and we see now the overlay of affordability in terms of can you afford it, availability in terms of do you have a device, and now, you know, in terms of accessibility or availability in terms of infrastructure, excuse me, and accessibility in terms of device, we are now seeing, and I'm just going to go to the case of education, 53 million kids sent home, out of that, 9 million kids don't have broadband at home nor a device. And if you think about black and brown kids in particular, it's been stated that black and brown kids who do not stay connected to learning will lose about five years of cognitive development. 
So I say that to suggest that the digital divide is not a binary context. It's a necessary tool that is actually going to be the trajectory of, I think, quelling challenges and barriers to the host of systemic inequalities that we now actually see in our society. It is creating, by not being online, another, Amer another America, which Michael Harrington, the sociologist, once said, you know, we don't want to be in a state where people fall off of the roles of unemployment. I'm afraid, particularly in my research, Jeff, and, and the fact that in my book, I went around the country prior to the pandemic to about seven cities and talked to people around the country, farmers, uh, low-income people, people from cities, older people. And I can tell you this, the reason I say that they're the new underclass, because farmers have the same challenges as, you know, the young man that I met in Stanton, Virginia, whose data runs out in the middle of the month and cannot find employment as a day laborer. So I just want to add that, that we're really in the state of, I think, trauma in terms of your ability to be connected to the resources that you need to survive, not just this immediacy of this pandemic, but really, you know, the facets of everyday society. Yeah, that's great. And I just want to welcome in George Ford, who's able to connect here. Uh, he's the chief economist of Phoenix Center for Advanced Legal and Economic uh, Public Policy Studies. Um, and also something I didn't mention at the beginning, if anyone in the audience wants to ask a question, please use the Q&A feature and we'll be sure to get to your questions. Uh, just building off that, Carlos, I wonder, I want to bring you in here and, and talk a little bit about some of these, these other communities that we might not think about that really get a huge benefit from broadband connectivity uh, the LGBT community obviously has their own challenges. Can you talk a little bit about the digital divide and how that affects that community? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the most fascinating things that's come, at, come out of this COVID epidemic is, is kind of the focus on the digital divide and kind of the shift in thinking from this being an economic issue to this being a social and, you know, injustice issue as well. Um, in many ways, a lot of the countries catching up to the problems that have been uh, plaguing minority communities for a long time. Um, the LGBT community and the digital divide is one of those examples. Uh, for LGBT individuals, the internet has been a lifeline for many years. Uh, and that lack of access to the internet has more than just economic impact. Um, for a young person that's starting to deal with their identity, starting to come out, many times the internet is the first place that they will turn to, to find a community, to start asking questions, to find resources. Um, as we know from research, the LGBT community is obviously has a higher risk, you know, youth, young, youth people in the LGBT community have a higher risk of suicide and depression than uh, the, the uh, straight cisgender community. And a lot of times that's because of discrimination that they may face not only at school or in the community, but at home as well. So the internet has been an outlet and a safe space for the LGBT community for a very long time. Um, and their lack of internet access, especially in rural communities where they, their identity may not be accepted or they may have a harder time fitting in, is something that is really, really uh, impactful. So when we talk about digital divide and the access to online, um, we are talking about the ability to access telehealth services for doctors that may understand your issues in a way that nobody does. We're talking about the ability to employ, uh, obtain employment in areas of the country where being out may not be compatible with some of the local opportunities. And we're talking about the ability to build community with other like-minded individuals in areas where you may not actually have anyone around you um, that is out or, uh, or identifies as LGBTQ. So economic issues are definitely a huge impact, but there are so many more social issues that come about as, as a result of lack of access to opportunity that come up as part of the digital divide. That's great. And I want to bring Hal and George here uh, in here. You can, you know, feel free to talk a little bit about, you know, what is the digital divide, how it affects communities. But I also want to reach uh, into a different part of this discussion. What's actually causing the divide? And, you know, there's many different factors that can contribute to uh, whether somebody has broadband connectivity. And, and you know, when, when we're talking about bridging the digital divide, we have to ask, you know, what is the metric for actually understanding whether that gap is getting smaller? Is it something as simple as people have access or is there more to it? Is there adoption metrics? What, what should we be looking at to determine whether that, that gap is actually closing? Go ahead, Al. <laughs> well, in terms of metrics, um, you know, I'm, I'm worried. I, I wanna go back and talk about the metrics and, and, what, and what has worked and what hasn't worked in the past, but, but I feel like we can't ignore what, what's happening you know, before our eyes right now in terms of the pandemic and, and, the, and the mass unemployment uh, that's going on. I read a story today, the cover story of the Washington Post, and it's a topic that Nicole just, just picked up. 
about about students without access. Uh, you know, she she gave a stat, but I'll give you a stat that came out of the, the post today. It says uh, in, in Florida's Duval County, out of the 130,000 students, more than 40,000 don't have devices at home to do their work. And it also reports uh, that 700,000 students in, in California um, don't have devices or broadband connections. And the idea is that these these kids and probably they're, they're probably on the low end of the of the income spectrum are going to be forced to go back into school at least in florida um and, and that's a choice that we're not imposing on on a on middle and upper income um, uh, households and i feel like uh we are we are teetering here at the edge of of the social compact and i feel like we're, we're abandoning uh this this pledged for public education and I, we can go back and talk about old metrics, but I feel like we're in a whole new ball game here. The, the level of urgency um, now, I mean, if it wasn't already, it's, it's now off the charts. And we got to figure out how to take care of this. We cannot uh, abandon these kids. That's right. Thank you, Hal, for that. It's been a long time to have, me have you say that. <laughs> <I> appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I would uh, agree with Hal on that a little bit. Um, this uh, COVID thing is, I mean, it's just changed everything. It's very even hard to think back at what the way we used to think about and talk about things. Um, I mean, I could, you could imagine, I mean, the one thing that struck me particularly about a lot of the arguments about schoolwork is that what sort of irresponsible uh, leadership in schools is assigning work to kids uh, that requires an internet connection that they don't have. Um, that's not a social problem. That's a, a education leadership problem. Uh, I didn't have a computer and, and I got an education. Um, so it was, you know, but now the kids are stuck at home. I mean, there's really nothing you can do about it. And the, and, and now the part of the public education is having the education occur online, which means a internet connection at the home is now an essential input to the provision of education. So that really sort of throws a whole wrinkle into the into the argument because now you're really forced to, I think, um, uh, make that happen. The uh, you know, but we I mean, still the economics um, that from the past are relevant here. There's a lot of people that just don't want to be online. Um, we're never going to have a hundred percent penetration. I think that's a that's a, a a hurtful way to think about it. Um, there are people who want to be online. Uh, there are people who will benefit greatly from being online, and there are people who don't want to be online. And in the old days, it was about 60% of the people that weren't online said, I don't want to be online. It wasn't the price or the affordability. I suspect that's changed a little bit in this environment. So even some of the data that we have is, uh, is a bit out of um, sync with the times. But I still think, in part, that's true. There's a lot of bad things on the internet, and when we talk about the good things on the internet, there's a, the internet does a lot of bad things. Um, I worry about my parents, you know, getting caught up in some kind of fraud, you know, that kind of thing. So, uh, what do they say? A quarter, a third of ministers are addicted to porn. You know, I mean, there's a lot of ugly on there that people may not want to be a part of. But it's getting hard to do it now that the government is sort of making everything online and you have to do it online and they throw you in jail if you don't do it um it's it changes the nature of the conversation can i can i, think, I jump, can yeah, I jump yeah, real quick? i was just gonna bring you in I, thank you I'm, I'm just itching on this so i want to respond to what george said about these public school teachers i want to be real clear about it too listen this is uh public school traditions are actually coming off of the heels of the board uh the brown versus board of education where public schools have always been systemically behind when it comes to resources we cannot blame superintendents for dealing with a national issue that has been on the table for 20 years that has not been solved digital access has always been number seven compared to number one when it comes to other uh drivers of our economic fulfillment here in this country and i've spent george i mean you know politely to you i just i have spent a lot of time with superintendents who are on the phone trying to figure out how to build mesh networks that is not what they do 
what they do is to educate children. If you're in a public school where your kids are walking around with the, 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 uh, not the latest version of the textbook, you're definitely not going to have a tablet. And when we were in the 60s and that was happening, it created the same educational inequities that we're actually seeing today. So I do think we have to take a little pressure off of the schools because the schools are doing the best that they can. I'm actually working on a series on that after talking to a lot of schools. They're trying to figure it out the same way that we're all trying to figure it out. But I do want to speak to the stat, though, which I think you're completely right in terms of there are a bunch of people who do not want to be online. But the challenge today is if you are still living within an analog society, you are not a productive citizen because you are missing out on all of the benefits that are actually being accrued from the Internet. And it costs more to be digitally excluded in terms of, you know, your ability to purchase something off of Instacart versus your ability to have to go into the only corner drugstore that's open in a community that's a food desert to be able to get the things that you need. So I think, you know, as we've been talking about this, it's really important for us to contextualize the digital divide within this contemporary place. Even without COVID, there was going to be some type of moment inflection point where we would realize that everything that we are doing right now is actually migrating to the internet. So I just want to put it out there. You know, George, you and I go back and forth, but I had to put that out there because I think public school teachers are getting a bad rap and they're doing the best that they can in this environment to figure out how to keep kids connected to learning, not necessarily to a computer. So what we're saying is in this moment, right? I mean, you talk about in this moment, and that was my point. In this moment, things are radically different than they were. Yeah, yeah but, but they should have been more... I don't envy them having to do it because it's not it's not really in their skill set. And right. I don't envy anybody right now that's got to figure out how to spend a budget and particularly a tight budget that the schools operate under. This is a this is a train wreck in all respects. It's an economic yes. wreck. Can I add one more benefit of broadband that Nicole has done a great job laying out most of them, but I want to add one more, Nicole, and you probably have, have already beat me here to it, but I, I think it's worth telling our audience who can't get said enough, but you know, we have, um, we have 30 million workers receiving unemployment benefits right now, and I think they're chasing around 5 million job openings. And there was a, um, an important study in 20, 2016, it came out by the Council of Economic Advisors and, and explained how, how one of the benefits of broadband is it speeds up the process by which the unemployed uh, find new jobs. And, uh, you know, as, uh, as George said, it's a train wreck. If you've got, if you got 30 million people and, and tens of millions without, you know, without a connection to the internet, I mean, we're, we're facing a, um, a severe crisis of, of long-term unemployment and yes, not being productive uh, members of society. So and we got we to gotta fix this thing and we got to fix it like yesterday. Yeah. That's great. I, I, oh, sorry, go ahead, George. Who's going to fix it? Um, you got that issue too, and you know there people have ways of 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 uh, finding finding access if if they really need it badly enough. Um, I think I still think the education problem is the biggest problem that we face right now, and almost all the attention uh, with respect to digital digital divide should be focused on that because we're not very good at doing multiple things with the government, but maybe we can do one thing, uh, and we need that done you know, you know today possibly. I think my kid starts next week. Um, supposedly starts next week. Um, so um, I think that's, you know, how we solve it. But, you know, I, I, I had a paper on that years ago on, on job search and, and the libraries were effective ways, you know, public access was an effective way for people to search for jobs. And that may be in some areas the best we can do. I mean, we're not, I don't think it's worth spending $200,000 to pass a house down some country road. So, because I'm the moderator, I'm going to take my privilege here. I was going to talk about this later in the discussion, but I want to bring it up now because I think it fits in well to this discussion. We are, so far we've been talking a lot about education and we, you know, we focus a lot on connectivity. Do people have connections to the internet? But you, as a couple of you have brought up already, devices are a big part of this. Are we focused too much on connectivity and not enough on the devices that, you know, people are going to use if we, you know, provide home broadband to everybody, but they can't afford an iPad to do the homework? Are we really solving any problems? And I, I think George's paper talks a lot about, you know, how to maximize subsidies. If we're, are we, would we be wasting money then if we're focused too much on, on connectivity and not about devices? I guess is, is my question to the panel. Yeah, I can start. I was like, Carlos, you get in, right? <laughs> yeah. So I, 
following up on, on, uh, on what George said, absolutely. I think that the, the ability libraries and other places like that are crucial. Um, not everyone has the ability to have a device at home and it's gonna take some private and public partnership. And that's, it's not just the government that, that has the, the burden here. We're gonna to have to do some philanthropy work around this. We're gonna to have to do some work with uh, providing devices. One of the programs, and there's my plug, Nicole, one of the programs that we run is called Power On. And our Power On program provides technology to LGBT centers around the country. Um, so we connect centers, um, we, give, we call them up, we find out what they need. They need laptops, they need tablets, they need phones for their LGBT homeless youth to come in. And we provide that to them. We're serving you know, centers across 22 states right now. And the purpose of that is to have a place for someone who doesn't have a connection at home to be able to go and have that connection. And obviously COVID has kind of wrecked all of that because no one can gather anymore. And that's creating an isolation that people were not expecting. Uh, people who use libraries, people who use community centers for connection are missing out right now. And that may be the only lifeline they had and that may be the only opportunity they had. So the ability for private industry and groups to step in and provide devices is crucial here. Uh, and it is one of the things that I think is being overlooked the young right. connection is the fact that you have to have somebody to connect to the internet in order to take advantage of it. Right. So I tell people, you know, the inter not having a device is like not having a car and trying to get on the highway. You can't go anywhere, right? Because you need some type of mechanism that's going to get you one place or another. Now, what's so nice about the internet today, and I think all of us on this uh, conference can actually speak to, is that, you know, we don't have to carry around big car phones in bags. We don't have to carry around small, minuscule beepers. We have actually different ways that we can actually connect. And there are different modalities in which we can connect. And I think one of the things that we're missing out on, and I would not just apply this to schools in terms of kids not having a 21st century uh, computer or tablet, it's the same thing with telehealth. How do we actually get more people to utilize telehealth services if they don't have a vehicle to actually talk to their doctor? And I think this is a different way, I think, of envisioning what does universal service potentially look like or where do we make partnerships with philanthropy that may come in and fill the blanks, fill in the blanks when it comes to that. When Obama was actually in office, he put together this program called Connect Ed, where he wanted to connect 99% of schools to high-speed broadband. Um, as part of my book research, I actually went to two places, Phoenix, Arizona, and Marion, Alabama, who were beneficiaries of those tablets. They had tablets within the classroom. But I think to Carlos' points, to uh, uh, George's point and Hal's point, the challenge is, let's say you live in a community where a library is five miles each way. Let's say if you live in a community where you don't have whole broadband. What I found in some of those schools that unless those kids were able to maximize the opportunities by taking it home, it was still a shiny object within the school. And so I think we still have to think about, you know, we have archaic, broken, outdated universal service programs that actually fund technologies that are not necessarily the latest in technology, nor are they the greatest. And so we have to figure out ways that we actually, Carlos, to your point, sort of bring this together. I was on a panel yesterday on telehealth and I uh, was with two doctors who run big hospitals. And I said, wouldn't it be great if you could prescribe a tablet the same way you prescribe a pill? <laughs> Giving people the opportunity to have a gateway to utilize these services, particularly for those that are underserved, I think is something that we cannot take for granted. Yeah, can I just say subsidized computers? I don't know if, if, uh, if it's just any more complicated than that, but if poor, if, if poor kids need a computer to connect then subsidize the damn computer. Let's yeah. move on. It'd be yeah. one of the best investments. I mean, how much is this going to cost? Two hundred dollars? It'd, it'd be one of the best investments that the government could make. Uh, it's a long-lived asset, five years, and my God, a kid would have the connection. Obviously, we'll, we'll talk about getting them the connection as well. But you need two necessary inputs here: computer right. and connection. Let's solve this. This is not rocket science. A lot of schools today um, give you know, Chromebooks and things like that. And I think they, they come highly subsidized so because we contract people, I guess. But, um, you know, they use those and they put the textbooks on them and that saves a lot of money. Um, that sort of thing has been implemented in many schools. I suspect it doesn't. And like Nicole says, you may you may have some rural school that doesn't have an internet connection. What is the good does 500, you know, Chromebooks do if you don't have an internet connection or you don't have anybody that can teach? That's right. um, how to do that. And that's been a problem forever. I mean, my mother, who's re been retired from teaching for 40 years now, probably, you know, had that same issue back then. She had computers and they weren't connected 
connected to anything. We're connected to each other. Um, and that's a, you know, a problem with some extent the way education systems get managed and the way that the internet gets deployed to various places. But, you know, I mean, the states should have, should have taken care of that a long time ago. I mean, this education is primarily a state function. Um, I think that probably falls in their lap for, for not having connections at the schools. Well, also though, and, and I just to point out that, George, because I think there's been a lot of conversation about this with this uh, current stimulus bill that's actually still being debated and what got to the last stimulus bill for Congress around the pandemic. What we also find is when you look at programs like E-Rate for libraries and for schools, that they still are under educational purposes. So even if you buy, so for example, with the school in Phoenix, he actually had a one-to-one -one solution for every student in that school, but knew that there was no broadband access for those kids to take it home. So it was one of those cases where the object stayed at the school. In Marion, Alabama, this really feisty lady that I met who was the principal of a K through 12 school at that, a consolidated school, actually worked out a deal with a, a broadband provider to put internet access on the tablet so they could take it home. The challenge, she said, was every three months of the year during summertime, they had to bring them back. So for three months, they weren't connected. And so I think, you know, what we're finding are a lot of these case by case, you know, without federal support or federal intervention, without states understanding the importance of actually driving broadband to those uh, uh, necessary institutions like libraries and schools and potentially community-based organizations that can fill gap stops. And I think those are where the blind spots have actually emerged that we're seeing much more clearly during this pandemic. And I agree with everybody, this is a moment in time, but if this dictates the future, this could have been like a natural disaster. It could have been a huge blackout like it was in New York late in the seventies. The bottom line is we should be better prepared for this. Shame on us for not actually being better prepared. And I don't want to ignore these special challenges for rural schools as exactly. well. Exactly. When we talk exactly. about when we talk about schools in the cities, you know, it's it's fine to say you have access at school and somebody can come in and be there in ten minutes. I consulted with a college, a community college in West Virginia, and their students are coming in one or two hour drives each way, so they yeah. don't have the ability to pop in and just kind of use the computer lab for ten and twenty minutes. So the challenges of the rural communities that were already you know much greater in so many ways have been exacerbated in such a way that. It makes it really hard to think about just providing schools and libraries with support as a solution that's going to affect rural communities in a way that's going to be meaningful. That's so, right. So I want to jump in here and try to expand the discussion a little bit. We've, we focused a lot on the, on the education side of this. Obviously, that's kind of the most pressing thing. But we also do want to talk about some of these rural urban you know, disparities. And that's one of the questions we already received was, you know, what, how can we start addressing some of these, these disparities between rural and urban communities. And, you know, there's uh, definitely different aspects that go into it, as George has talked about, adoption versus access. With the rural communities, access might be a little bit more of an issue. So I guess let's, let's kind of bridge into that a little bit. How can we spur some deployment in, in these areas? And Hal and George, I know you both have talked about RDOF and BTOF and some of these different programs that and how they have or haven't worked in the past. So if we are going to spend limited universal service funding or some other mechanism, maybe if Congress passes some new bill that is outside of universal service um, or just a different program, what are the, what are the considerations to be uh, mindful of before we go ahead and, and, and spend the money? Because obviously if we're spending money and we're not getting a good return, then that money's being wasted and we could have been using that elsewhere. So what, what are ways that we can spur uh, some of the deployment of these services in rural areas and what lessons in the past can we, can we take away? Well, I think we have a pretty good template um, in in this auction. I, you mentioned RDOF. I don't want to kill people with acronyms, but but we have a pretty nice template, uh, which allows firms to 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 show up at an auction and uh, and basically bid for who could serve an area at the lowest cost. And uh, I think uh, we've put about twenty billion into these programs. We're about to have an auction uh, uh, at the end of this year. But to get to 100%, and that might be too ambitious of a goal, but, but uh, bear with me, um, the FCC estimated in 2017 that, uh, that we would have to uh, spend about $80 billion. So, so that, that leaves us, um, uh, you know, while the $20 billion RDOF uh, investment is, is a nice start, that's going to leave us about $60 billion short if we wanted to get to 100% uh, coverage with these fiber to the premises or cable services. Um, because the, the very last homes are the most expensive, 
uh, to, to build out to, we could actually get to 98% coverage uh, for about half of, of that 80 billion or, or 40 billion. And, and if that were the, the, uh, the objective, uh, then we would need about another $20 billion to put into the program. But, but I'm, I'm pr pretty confident and hopeful uh, that this auction mechanism uh, will be an efficient way of getting, of, of getting more uh, broadband out into rural areas. I think I think the RDOP, particularly if we're in a hurry, um, will will work. Um, there are problems with um, you know where do you spend the money? You know they got mapping problems, um, and we want to spend millions on maps. And I just think we suck at maps. And there's got to be some other way. I mean, I keep thinking as an economist, how do I figure this out? Could we put a bounty on uh, new homes connected or some other way? other than trying to map something when we map 95% of what we map is covered. So we've wasted that money. Um, so I keep thinking there's got to be a better way to do that. But RDOP is, is, you know, it's shelf ready, I guess, and it seems to work pretty well. It could be modified to, to optimize if the money is constrained to spend it where it's most productive. Um, the other issue is, and since, since we talked about RDOP, is, is subsidies, lifeline. Um, is that the mechanism by which we will um, pay for kids to have uh, home broadband connections during the school year or whatever, however extensive we're going to make a, a uh, broadband subsidy? And that, that program is a mess. Um, it's got its good points and its bad points. I think it's poorly understood and, and discussed from a policy perspective. Um, I'd, I'd be reluctant to run $10 billion through it, um, the way it works now and the way it's thought of now, um, that's going to be an issue. You know, it might be better to subsidize schools, but, you know, they don't, you know, these bureaucracies don't, are not real good at making decisions uh, a lot of times, particularly on the fly about technology. So um, I think distributing that money, getting the money is one thing, and it's nice to have $100 billion, whatever it's going to be, but how in the world are you going to distribute it? Because the way we did it with the ARA was a mess. I mean, it was mostly politics and good projects didn't get funded and you start throwing money around like that, everybody shows up trying to get a cut for doing nothing. And that's so, just my uh, can, I, can I jump in, Jeff? Yeah, real definitely. Quick, real thing. So um, I, I actually uh, wrote a paper about this and, you know, I'm, I'm not going to tell my age, but I've been doing this for a long time, like my colleagues on this call. But, you know, I think also we've come to this sta sta stalemate when it comes to talk about rural broadband. I think we try to assume that, one, we pit rural versus urban when they both have equal challenges. Urban is probably more uh, of an issue of less competition in terms of providers, in particular census tracts. In rural, we actually know it's the cost of building facilities. I think on the case of rural, one of the things that I've learned in this tour that I did and actually being in this space for quite some time is that we keep trying to put the uh, square peg in the round hole. And there's now these opportunities as we actually get to, I think, some of the more complicated areas, potentially more localized areas, to think of uh, solutions that may be customized to that particular community. So I went out to Garrett County, Maryland, for example, which is actually deploying Microsoft's Airband Initiative. They're using what I talked about with Harold Feld and Michael Calabrese, 25 years ago, white space technologies. And they're doing a darn good job because the people who didn't have any ice cream before, they at least got a couple of flavors to work from. And all they want to do is order equipment for the farm and they want to be able to, you know, email the auto mechanic wants to be able to email to get the right parts for vehicles. Process would have taken him, you know, two to three weeks now takes two minutes. I think our understanding and the federal policy space is that we have to come up with a wholesale solution to solving rural problems. And I think we're at a state right now, because of what George says, we don't have sufficient data. We know that there's going to be um, a lack of huge return on investment in certain areas. And we know there's going to be more cows than people in particular rural communities, it's important that we start thinking differently. Instead of talking about rural divides, talk about rural solutions. The second thing I wanna quickly say too is, we keep trying to do the same thing with universal service. Technology has surpassed our wildest dreams, but yet we still think that $9 and some change is good enough to give a low income person access to the internet. Why is it that my kids can get exempted from their data uh, Spotify and Pandora and other, you know, music apps, and we cannot give a low income person zero rated data to get access to a workforce development site or to find a job.
And so I think one of the things we've done with universal service is we, again, keep staying constrained in models that may not be as efficient to allow more people to get connected. The other thing that we've done, and so last thing I'll say on this, and this is in my book, we've also looked at universal service as an incremental fund that we sort of wait till we collect the money and then we spend it. What we found out in the pandemic is we needed a national appropriation or somewhere in treasury so we could actually get those laptops that Hal's talking about to students and figure out ways to actually subsidize costs. What confuses me about universal service is as the number of cable operators and telecom operators get smaller, the number of big tech companies get bigger and they ride on the same network, but they don't give anything to universal service. So I wanna put that out there for some provocation as we think about, again, trying to configure universal service in ways that the supply and demand models of technology just don't mesh up anymore. And if we're talking about 18 million plus people that are offline, we're not gonna ever have enough money to connect them. And so I think, you know, to George's point, there is an immediate need for subsidies and emergency broadband relief now, which we could do because there's a lot of unused money in those buckets, but there's a need to go back and sort of revamp the way we look at universal service and who contributes and where that money sits so we can solve problems in the immediate, particularly for those who are most vulnerable. Uh, I agree. I'm sticking with it. <laughs> I, I agree with Nicole on the point that these, these are going to have to be nuanced solutions. And to some extent, I, I kind of like a, a little bit of experimentation and, and suffering at the lower level to find those solutions rather than to be told this is the solution you're going to accept and it'd be totally undoable wherever they are. I mean, you see that a lot when you go out and you talk to people. It's not what you think. You know, you can be in Washington and you think, oh, here's the solution to the problem. And you go out and talk to the person and they'll say, no, I can't do it that way, period. Um, I need more flexibility, but then you get flexibility and that causes problems. All of this, okay, all of this is a lesson. I mean, the government has been trying to solve this problem for years. And, and, and every system we have to solve it is defective in fairly obvious ways. That's what we're going to get. Okay, we're going to, that system is going to maintain itself and we will nibble at the edges and fix it here and there. But until there's some radical way of, of changing the way our government operates, it's going to be a kludge and it's, it, there's going to be a lot of ugliness to it. Um, but I do think if we could get out of this 100% adoption, 100% availability, everybody's got fiber to the home, it's got to be fiber, it can't be coax because a gig over coax is somehow different than a gig over fiber, whatever it is that people are thinking, um, then, then we'll, we'll make more progress. But uh, you've still got to have a system that can allow flexibility downstream. It's just not ripe for fraud. That's right, that's right. Jeff, Jeff I, I know you wanted to take us in the rural area and these, these guys brought us back to the, to the Lifeline program. So I feel compelled that I have to kind of weigh in with my two cents. Is that okay? We can go back to talk about rural too, but. Well, I'll bring us back to rural in a minute. We can okay. keep doing the lifeline discussion now. <laughs> but I, I think that the policies that are swirling around, and I, I think this came from uh, Gene Kimmelman's testimony, um, and I believe it was in, in the Senate um, maybe two months ago. I just wanted to put these out here and, and, and maybe get some responses, but they seem smart to me. I mean, one is, is the notion of raising the user subsidy in lifeline for low-income families. It's currently at nine twenty-five a month, and that seems skimpy relative to the to the price of, of broadband today. And he also advocated um, allowing the subsidies to support standalone broadband. So it seems like like right now, perhaps the subsidy can only be applied if you buy a bigger package that includes broadband plus something else, and that that shouldn't be a requirement for for the program. And then finally, he, he's, he's, he's saying that we should have more robust education campaign to inform eligible households of the subsidy. I, I, I find nothing objectionable about uh, any of those three. And, and I, think, uh, I think now is the time uh, to, to increase it and to educate and to divorce it from whatever other conditions come along to it, having to buy ride on or ancillary services. Um, so I'll just put that out there and, and say, you know, what's, what's uh, What's wrong? What's wrong with that? Could, could we get a consensus on that? Well, I think, I, go ahead, go ahead, George. Go ahead. Well, 
when I, I was going to say, I mean, I, I heard Jean's testimony. I think it's it's right, but I still think it stays somewhat constrained with around this nine dollar price point. You know, it's that's sort of like the discount table at Staples. You know, you kind of go there to get what you need. I mean, I think earlier on we talked a lot about people having free choice of what they wanted to do with that subsidy, and I also do worry because if you look at rural areas where they have skimpy uh, connectivity, there are a lot of people that I met that are still using a darn telephone just to make sure that they have communication services. So you're actually having people choose between both. So I don't think it's as easy as those three buckets. I mean, I think the one thing that I would actually sort of caveat off of that, uh, what Jean suggested is 10 years ago, we talked about making sure that every eligible agency knew about Lifeline. Carlos remembers, yeah. you know, it was, a, it was a, a marketing campaign to government agencies who were working in housing or working in some sort of um, support TANF to let people know. I, I talk to superintendents that don't even know about Lifeline, let alone the provider in their particular district. And so I think, you know, we can keep, again, staying with programs that we think fit in 1986 and have morphed into the evolution of technologies, but we have to just do a better job. People are using the internet and they're getting, and I think this is the point that Scott Walston made, even if you offered it for $1.99, doesn't necessarily mean people still wanna pay for it. And so the question becomes, for people who we know are eligible for a multiplicity of services, I like that point. Do they know that this program exists and it can help subsidize some of the uh, decisions that they have to make over broadband, over bread? But then we also have to think about, are we giving people enough options or free choice to do what they want with that subsidy versus sort of constraining them to one thing or the other? So, you know, that's, that's my opinion from going out there and talking to people. I can tell you most of the people that I spoke to that were probably eligible for a Lifeline Connection didn't even know what the program was about. Um, <laughs> Nicole, you wanted, you, you, oh, sorry, Carl, let's go ahead. No, just, just that point, I think that we sit, we sit in a place where the lifeline is a short, you know, shorthand and we all have this idea of what it is. But when you talk to anyone outside of our bubble, it is really hard to find people who understand the program, who know what it's for, or know, know whether they're eligible, eligible. So the education around lifeline has to increase because there's definitely a lack of knowledge from people who could use this program about its existence. Mm -hmm. Nicole, so, I, I was just curious what, and sorry to cut you off, George, but I just want to get some clarification from Nicole. Um, are you in favor of increasing it above the current 925, as I am? You don't have to take my position, but I, I, mean, I couldn't I'm tell favor, what's based on your answer. I'm in favor of increasing. I think it should actually do some type of adjustment upwards. But, you know, the way the government has it, what is it going to be, $12? I mean, I think I have to look at studies on what the flat rate will be towards the investment of Lifeline. I do think we should give people, much like we try to give a livable wage, some kind of livable broadband subsidy that they yeah. can actually, uh, you know, I, I think I saw in some paperwork uh, that came across my desk, this emergency broadband relief fund, that uh, there's a proposal that's going into the HEROES Act to give people somewhere between 20 and $50 to be able yeah. to support their connectivity. I mean, I think the key thing is people should have something that they can work with, uh, which is why I think we see the low penetration, not because they also don't know about it, but I think a lot of people are wondering, what can I get with this, particularly if it's bundled with something else? Yeah. Okay, good. Good. All right. A lot of house, we're close. We're close. <laughs> close. Make it bigger. Might, Go ahead, George. You guys can maybe talk about it better than I can about there. There are some people just averse to being involved in government programs. Um, and, and um, but the, the Lifeline program is, is fascinating in a number of ways. I mean, it's, it's completely transformed itself into, into basically, I think over 90% of the people get their uh, their Lifeline service for no cost. Um, they get a, a cell phone for free and they have, it's a limited service, it's three gig a month or something like that. Um, and, you know, some text messages and some calls and, and or free text messages and then and maybe 350 minutes or 600 minutes of phone calls. And that's the way it's developed. And I think it's a fascinating uh, development in the industry and, a, and an, in, an important part of the way I think we should think about this in the future. Um, that service, the ser Lifeline service is free, but it's not highly substitutable mm -hmm. with the regular service that, that people might buy. And that's very important because what you do is you keep people from using the service who don't need it necessarily. And at the, you have a very low price point. So anybody that wants it can have it. Okay. Um, if you're willing to put up with, with the fact that you're in a, involved in a government program, which some people are, are averse to doing, I think we need to think kind of the same way about going forward. I don't think you want to have the government give away 
um, gigabit connections to people or pay the monthly fee for a gigabit connection for anybody because that's going to be unbelievably expensive to do because who wouldn't take it? Um, what the ought to be is kind of like the Comcast did with Internet Essentials and the other guys do with their similar programs is to have a service that will get you the education uh, educational needs met and if you can get your educational needs met you can pretty much get anything else met that's important and I don't consider watching Netflix worth subsidizing um, but education may the healthcare thing I think you can get by with a decent connection with just at least doctor's visits you're not going to be reading x-rays or anything but um, I think that we need to start thinking of uh, when I can't let ourselves um, say if we're going to subsidize the internet, we're going to subsidize the internet and everybody's going to have these super duper connections at no cost because that, that, that'll, I mean, we'll be spending billions and billions and billions of dollars on that. And I think we could probably get something that would serve the need better and have a very low price and, and an affordable subsidy um, that has a, a, a internet connection that may be just be 25, three rather than something else. But that, that I'm just going back to these nuanced solutions um, rather than um, rather than having a one size fits all. And the, right. and the Lifeline program is about to change. The FCC is raising the minimum standards for that, which means most likely the, the free service that's been available in the past will no longer be available at a time when you've got a 30% unemployment rate. I mean, it's just, it's just nuts. But those are the kind of decisions that are going to get made and don't think that there's going to be some perfect regulator from a parallel universe that's going to drop in right now with COVID and make the government work better. That's not going to happen. But, but I, I do want to actually add into this uh, lifeline thing. And if any of you write about this, I know where to find you because this is an idea that's in my book. <laughs> I, know I'm, I know who I'm on the panel with, so I'm going to bring it out there. And would love to have more conversation with anybody who's actually listening. So I think, you know, given the, the fact that we're still sort of stuck on what to do with universal service in its current form, and it obviously has become more of a partisan tool in terms of changing by administrations, I do think, George, to your point, where we're missing the ball is this. For low-income people and people who are disproportionately represented on the Internet, it has a lot to do with data. It has a lot to do with the, the restrictions of Lifeline when it comes to not just my connection, but what I could actually use my data for. So I'm a big proponent in the fact that I don't care what people use their data for because we should not tell people whether or not they should go to Netflix or not. But what I am concerned about is are we thinking about ways that we can maximize and amplify Lifeline? So about three years ago, and Hal and Carlos remember maybe when I might have said this under the net neutrality debate, it was controversial, when I talked about zero rating government service content and finding ways to amplify a lifeline benefit by using the same technologies that we are all engaging with, the same types of programs that allow people to find a job, to be able to get to their provider. You know, I was, I was talking to John P. I was over at Carnegie Mellon. And I said, how much bandwidth would it take to go to a .gov? <laughs> And when I think about the people that I interviewed, and Carlos actually has the same amount of folks with his program, could you think about the amplified benefit of being able to give somebody unlimited access to those websites that allow them to improve quality of life? And I think that's where we actually get a lot of things wrong when we try to match outdated policies, outdated universal service delivery with new technologies and the future of innovation. It's very easy for me to do that as a personal subscriber to a wireless service. I want to offset my Spotify. I want to offset this. But we as a country have been shameful in allowing low-income people or people who are data limited, their ability to get to a .gov or potentially a .edu or something that is going to improve quality. Like, how about, you know, Blue Cross Blue Shield, if I'm a patient, you know, pay for my data for me to be able to do telehealth. At the end of the day, the biggest monetary expense that I think that we're going to experience is going to be data. And that's where, again, as I've gone out to talk to people, I'll give you a perfect example and then I'll shut up. It was in uh, Chris Wood at LGBT Tech took me out to Stanton, Virginia, where I met a guy named Joseph Mulgrave, young African-American guy who was a day laborer. Said he had a cell phone, but halfway through the month, the minutes ran out and he was unemployed for the rest of the month until his minutes renewed on this uh, feature phone. I went back to Stanton because out of my story, someone wanted to give him a laptop and give him you know, one year of unlimited service. 
I couldn't find him. His mother said his phone was off again. Those are people who are being disconnected by the constraints of our programs that are not allowing them to actually get the same type of fluid connectivity in those spaces that matter the most. So I'm all for that proposal. If I can figure out a way to get companies to actually think about that, the same way we've actually had COVID relief response and in the immediate, like you're saying, George, I think we're actually on to something where we begin to bring the innovation into these uh, programs that are meant for self-care and service delivery. Let me just say something, Jeff. Sorry, can yeah. I just jump in I'm on sorry, this? I'll be quiet. Yeah. <laughs> um, Go ahead, Harold and George. I, I don't, I don't want to uh, put restrictions on where uh, a kid, some poor kid who gets his first uh, internet connection, where he can go at night. And, you know, if he uses the thing to do school in the day, and then he wants to use it at night to go on to Netflix, as my kids do, I mean, this should make you happy. Right, you shouldn't be go. You shouldn't. I would upset. love it. I would love it if I can get that. <laughs> Trust yeah. me. We shouldn't, we shouldn't begrudge that. some poor kid who gets his first right. internet connection for having fun. God forbid at night after he's done his damn homework during the day. So we have to get over this thing about you know restrictions on where they can go. We need to give them access, right? And their happiness and their betterment is you know is going to redound eventually to society, and we're all going to be better off, and we should all be celebrating what these kids do on the internet and not, not trying to put any kind of confines or boundaries about but you, but you But you pay for your kid's fun the same way I do. And it costs me a lot of money and I have a job. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, George, you were going to say something? Well, well to, to quote Austin Powers, I'd like a toilet made of solid gold. But it's not in the cards now, is it? Um, it? This is the deal. We already have that. That innovation exists, Nicole. <laughs> Facebook's Internet Essentials, which has been deployed in other countries, but it wasn't deployed in India. We had a bunch of American net neutrality advocates run over there and get it shut down. But that's exactly the sort of model, and that's exactly the sort of thing that the private sector can innovate and provide. The question is whether or not that innovation can be brought in to the government. That's and if right. it can, then you start thinking about, well, how do I get the private sector to do it? What we saw in Lifeline is we gave 925 and somehow or another, sometimes through fraud, but not always, or not mostly, that people figured out how to give a, a basically a free service for that income. And sometimes people buy extra minutes and things like that, which makes it, makes it a better business. But the, you know, there could be just be a situation where uh, firms start, you know, if encouraged in a way, and I haven't thought through how you do it, but you design some sort of subsidy scheme that allows the private companies to develop programs that fit into this modality. But that must necessarily be limited in some way um, because you, you want to create what we call an okay. economic okay. separating equilibrium. George, I'll okay. A couple papers on this. It could be limited in terms of how fast the speeds are. So I'm, I'm with you in that dimension, but but I don't think you should limit it as to where the, where the kids could go no, once they, they, get, go. they get connected. All right, so I want to jump in real quick here. Um, a lot of the solutions we talked about earlier, not necessarily the more recent ones, but we all these things we have to consider with the contribution factor. If we increase the lifeline subsidy, it's going to cost more for people to get connection, and therefore we could see some people who lose service because they can no longer afford it. Are there ways of solving or bridging the digital divide that don't necessarily involve, uh, you know, Nicole talked about maybe getting access to government websites for free. Our streets worked a lot on infrastructure reform. Theoretically, if we could make it easier for companies to deploy in rights of way and, you know, attach to polls without exorbitant fees, maybe we could see some more services get out there so more access is available. It might facilitate WISPs or some other, you, you know, new service to come in and compete. I think Carlos, uh, LGBT tech has talked about, you know, getting more access to spectrum. Um, I know, I think that report was before the six gigahertz item uh, at the FCC, but there's, you know, obviously the more resources we get available to some of these uh, services, the, the easier it will be to connect more people. So are there other ways of, of, of viewing, of bridging the digital divide that don't necessarily have to do with, you know, a direct subsidy for any of these services, but just maybe good governance? I would add in what you just actually talked about, Jeff, in terms of unlicensed Wi-Fi being available in communities. Uh, going back to the school thing for just a moment, we had kids who were eligible for free and reduced price lunch, and I agree with George, companies like Comcast stepped in major to make sure people in their footprint were connected. I give them a lot of kudos for that, right? But I also know that we had like housing developments where these kids lived, 
and we were not able to get some of those housing developments to actually leverage free Wi-Fi. So kids that actually lived in those developments could actually use it and you know stay connected to school. I think it's important, and I know there's been some comment about BTOP, but I do like the part of the Digital Equity Act that begins to think about how do you fund local community infrastructure? So I think another way to actually bridge the divide is to think about that. I mean, the first article I wrote with the coronavirus was bring a Wi-Fi enabled school bus and park it in front of a low income community and allow kids to get access there. We have to figure out ways to build that infrastructure because again, libraries did a fantastic job of changing this, the nature of a digital parking lot into one where people could actually you know, leverage that Wi-Fi hotspot to get stuff done. But now we have to think about, and I'll say this, Jeff, how do you actually transform a digital parking lot into a digital park? How do you leverage these other assets that are within communities to ensure that there's connectivity? And I think in the past, we focused on anchor institutions like community colleges. I'm suggesting we need to go to churches and we need to go to social service agencies and we need to go to incubators and see ways that we could actually transmit single signals out in places where there are no Starbucks or cafes you know, where people, everyday people have to get online to do everyday things. Jeff? Yeah. Your, your question, I think, goes to the issue of how do you finance these subsidies? And, and when, you, when you asked it the way that you did at the beginning of your question was, you know, is it possible that we're going to end up pushing people, some people off because their prices are going to go up so as to afford this, this subsidy, right? That's, I think that's how you, that's what you yeah. meant in the question, okay. right? But, but that, that, presumes that all of this has to be financed uh, off the backs of broadband users. And that makes no sense at all. We don't, we don't want to tax broadband in order to subsidize it. That makes no sense. The funding for, for these programs should come from the treasury. It should be completely divorced from the broadband sector, right? We don't want to, we don't want to tax broadband or discourage broadband adoption if our overarching agenda is to increase broadband penetration. So all this funding is going to come from from the federal from the from the U.S. Treasury. <laughs> this is this is not broadband. This is not a, an FCC issue in many respects. This is a Department of Education issue mm -hmm. in all respects. Um, and so I do think that 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 Hal's correct that we need this 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 is money. This is spending money for education as much as it is anything at the, at this juncture in time. Hey, Carlos, you were going to jump in here, I think. Yeah, so again, not to, uh, less sexy, but just important is obviously the, uh, develop, you know, the development of broadband structures in communities like rural communities. Again, it's not as, you know, as highlighted, but the importance of building out broadband facilities in broadband com in rural communities is going to be key to get any of these other programs done. So infrastructure development, getting more facilities out there, focusing on mapping and making sure that the right communities that are not being served get attention is going to be crucial. Programs like the CARES Act, where you have $200 million that the FCC has for telehealth programs that are, you know, kind of band-aids right now, need to become more of a permanent conversation and part of the conversation going forward. Uh, so those issues are, are things that are going to be ongoing as we go through this. Going okay, and, and so we're, we're almost out of time, um, but I do want to get one of the audience questions in that kind of touched on something Nicole brought up near the beginning of the discussion, which the question is just, how can philanthropy help close the digital divide? I know, Nicole, you brought that up. I wanna know if you have any thoughts on that question and if anyone else wants to jump in there as well. You know, I mean, I think, um, and, and I would be remiss by not answering, how I do think it's a national treasury concern. I worry though about partisanship of cutting that. And I think Jeff's question was, you know, what else can we do? Because all the things that we're talking about gonna take so long and people need connectivity now. That's the problem, <laughs> the yeah. CARES Act to pass. But what I was going to say in terms of philanthropy, I think philanthropy plays a big role. I saw in the chat uh, the philanthropic partnership of Chicago Connected with the MacArthur Foundation and public schools and businesses. We need more of that. This is the time when community foundations can actually step in and help with the blind spots, you know, the blind spots of getting devices. Right now, we do not have a mechanism to trigger any kind of reimbursement or purchase of procurement of devices. I speak to a lot of uh, educators who are buying them out of their own budget. So we do need philanthropy to come in in that respect. Philanthropy can also be helpful in um, workers, you know, workers that are sitting there trying, I mean, if you look at 
the food pantry lines and you just imagine what it looks like within the home to be in a state. I was on a panel earlier yesterday where we were talking about the social isolation that families are feeling generally by not being connected. Uh, think about all the connectivity that we have. Philanthropy can come in and actually help to create more connected families. Um, or ensure that there's roles of connected elderly that are now sitting in nursing homes. I, I saw, heard a great example of a hospital that gives every patient a tablet so that they can actually do some type of stream uh, with a family member who cannot come and visit them within the hospital. And so I think it's really up to philanthropy to do what they do best, which is to distribute goodwill in places that government will not touch where industry may not have the resources to go further than what they already have done, and where civil society organizations know how to organize, but they don't know how to get the right resources to do that. So having that collaborative seats at the table, I think is where our philanthropy will find a really nice space in this pandemic and beyond. Immediately, anyone else? Oh, sorry, go ahead, George. Immediately, I would think uh, hotspots would be. Yeah, hotspots is another thing. That's right. That's right. I mean, that, we need that right now. I mean, solving the rural broadband availability problem is That's a right. five to 10 year problem, right? You're not going to get a connection built in a week. And we need That's a connection right. in a week. That's so right. I think philanthropy, and I don't think the federal government and probably most state governments are not going to be able to move quick enough to, to provide enough of that. But if you could find some way, to get you know Wi-Fi connectivity, even if you're interacting with a business and you'll pay the overage or whatever it is, because you know it's expensive to buy uh, uh, internet connections as a business, um, to to help support public access to the internet in, in convenient mm -hmm. places, particularly in, in in the rural areas, are going to desperately need that. Um, and, and and maybe it's the family dollar. I I think that that in my travel experiences that I think the the biggest determinant of not having internet is having a family dollar. <laughs> Great. Well, if there's any other last thoughts, feel free to jump in, but I think we're probably going to have to wrap it there. Unfortunately, I feel like we could have just had a full day of this discussion. <laughs> um, I, I really want to thank all the panelists for joining us. You know, I, I, I really think there's a lot of, of urgency on this issue right now. And we, we really do need to uh, make sure that people aren't being left behind, especially as the pandemic, you know, drives people off. So um, first of all, thank you to all the panelists. I, I really appreciate you coming on and joining us, all the people in the audience. We appreciate you participating in the chat and, and, and joining us uh, on the stream. Uh, there will be a video of this posted on YouTube. Um, so feel free to come back and, and watch us uh, again. I know it was so enthralling. You want to come back and watch it twice. Um, but Thanks, thanks again to everybody. Thank thanks, you, Jeff. Thanks, thanks for allowing us to talk, Jeff. <laughs> Good seeing everybody. We told you it was going to happen. <laughs>